Um, Welcome back to Behind the Play. My name is Alex Adams, and I'm joined by, uh, you know, one of our favorite uh, guests on this show, Ross Levitan of the Locked On Senators podcast. We're missing your, you know, your your partner in crime and, and Brandon Pillar, which we'll we'll have on a on a later show. But what's it like just being solo without your, you know, your best friend, uh, your your pod pod brother? I guess is the right way to describe it. Well, I'm not alone. I'm here with you. And funny you say that, Alex. Well, first of all, thanks for having me. I, I want to say we're the most you are you're at, guests. You're, at, you're at six. We're at, you're at six. You're we killing. like that. So that's awesome. And it's <laughs> great to see the growth of the show. Every time we come on, you're hitting milestones. And that's awesome. What I will say is this summer, we finally broke the streak where Pilsy and I did every single episode together, no matter what, no matter where we would find a way to make it work this summer. We worked smarter, not harder. Uh, I thought that after the postcast of 82 out of 82, I think we did 80 actually postcast and a daily show. We're like, you know what? Let's, let's do some pre-recorded things. And that way we're both on every episode, but then Mm -hmm. one of us would either do a segment or that sort of thing. So for the first time, I just sat in front of a microphone and and a camera and just talked to myself. It was surprisingly a little bit easier than I thought from the standpoint that you just wind me up and get me going. But um, I certainly prefer to have Pillsy on the show when when we do Locked On Sends. But I'm excited to chat with you, man. This is uh, this will be fun. It's going to be a, a, a fun, fun episode. It, was there a moment from the summer just for, for you, um, Pillsy, for the show that kind of sticks out for you after, you know, it's, it's we're, we're hitting September training camps coming. But what was the summer like for you? Summer was awesome. We got to go to the draft. So that being in Vegas, staying at the Venetian, which was attached to the sphere yep. where, where the draft was, um, getting to have Ian Mendez and Scott Wheeler come up to our room and do a live show. Just things that when we started the podcast would have just been so far-fetched to even think possible and being able to experience things in in person, right? We started the show during COVID basically, even before actually, but really picked it up during COVID and uh, it was so much Zooms and this and that. So to actually sit down, do live interviews and that sort of thing really gets me excited. And obviously the draft is such a spectacle where it's like, the way I describe it, it's like a, a Disney world for hockey fans. Like it's not <laughs> one team, right? You go into any arena during the season, that home team is dominant with the jerseys and all that. This is like a, a who's who. It's like a convention, right? Where it's it's so many different people from all over the place gathering to celebrate the best day of these kids' lives, getting drafted the NHL. So the draft, obviously spectacular. I'd highly recommend people going to that. And then it's just been a matter of of keeping up with all the change from Steve Steos and the Ottawa Senators. We have our color-coded depth chart now where I was just curious to see like how much turnover in the entire organization on the ice has there been in one year. And it's it's uncanny. Like it's a lot. So I think that that change gets you excited. And then just being able to kind of you know, take a step off being so serious in, in the season. Not that we're always serious, but um, in the off season, you can kind of have some more fun, whether it's interviews or we do this ring of honor where we just draft our favorite team. So summer was great, Alex, but when September comes, when, when the long weekends over Labor Day and the nights start getting colder, like it's just, it's time for hockey. It's, it's that it's, time of year. It's time, it's time for winds too, hopefully yeah. as well. But with that, just maybe on, on the summer, you, you guys are always so great at interviewing you know, up and coming prospects. Was there one interview throughout the summer that maybe you'd want Sens fans or like a personality that you think Sens fans might fall in love with? Well, yeah, if you haven't heard of uh, Brady Kachuk, he's probably the guy this summer. <laughs> like we love doing the prospect interviews, especially because I find like there's not enough coverage on them. And whether it's Hoyt Stanley, who's just the nicest kid. The guy pulled a an Alfie and a Carlson jersey out of his closet Crazy. while we were talking with him, which is so cool because he's a <laughs> Vancouver kid too. Yeah. But I love doing the prospect ones, but for us to be able to get Brady on, it, it was a white whale for us. We've got a few others. So if you can find Danny Heatley, Daniel Alfredson, Chris Neal, among others, would be probably three. Where is Elfie the- again? I don't know. Yeah, he should be a guy that we might be able to get on. Who knows? Stay tuned. But um, working our way through some white whales, I think, is is very exciting for us guys. When we started the show, circled like if we could ever get that person on the show. Would be great. Shelly Kettles is someone I want to get on to the skating whisperer yes. um, as well. So um, still, still lots of goals that we want to get, but getting the captain active captain on, uh, on the show was awesome. And 
Um, not this is pretty like insignificant in the grand scheme of things, but I've been saving it to start season six. We're gonna redo people kind of associate the the young Tim Stutzla, the young Jake Sanderson leading us into locked on sends every day. Those are gone at the start of the season. October first, it's getting replaced, and I've been holding on to it since since July. Alex, we've got Brady Kachuk uh, awesome. setting up locked on set. We just have to change the vibe a little bit, right? Jake, Timmy, they were there for three years. Both of those guys were three Ottawa Senators players when they did that for us. So it's time to change it up, and hopefully, uh, any little thing that we can do, Alex, as fans, to change the voodoo around the organization. We're going to take it upon ourselves to do it. So credit to us, and hopefully we have a good year. Do, do you feel that just with this team, that there is that different sense around? Like, I mean, I was, you know, at, uh, you know, Steos and Allmark's unveiling. Um, there is a lot of difference, different people behind the scenes. You know, there's way more, an influx of way more people uh, that the Senators have hired as well. Does it feel like finally the, the ship has sailed and that, you know, maybe that old owner... Uh, and everything that kind of happened then, that era is kind of done. And now we're in the Steve Steos and Lauer, kind of the new version of the Senators. Yeah, I certainly feel that. Now, I do want to be careful to an extent because until we see it on the ice, I mean, every team, you hear the old classic cliches, best shape of my life, and oh. we have so much hope, we have high expectations, and only half the teams make the playoffs overall. So there's always going to be let's say 10 really disappointed teams and six teams who kind of know they're in the rebuild and they're kind of not really competing for a playoff spot. Ottawa's not one of those six teams. The fan base is going to be really upset if this isn't a team playing meaningful games down the stretch. So I like the moves in terms of bringing in that experience, that leadership, guys who are coming from winning cultures, whether it's Boston, whether it's uh, guys who won the cup before and David Perron, Michael Amadio. So I like that concept. I'm curious to see how it works and how it pushes the core pieces that were here before to get better because that internal growth from Stutzla, Kachuk, Norris, Batherson, and obviously on the back end, Shabbat and Sanderson, that's the core of your team. How they go is how the team goes, and that's, to me, going to be the biggest question going into the year. How much do you think maybe this team is you know, having those veterans in place allows for those young players to, you know, who are not all so young now, like they're now in their kind of mid twenties in Sanderson, Stutzla, Kachuk, Batherson, Norris as well, that they can kind of surround them, put that imprint. Like how important do you think is that veteran leadership that Steve Seos has been banging on about all summer? Oh, I think it's, it's super critical, especially when you're coming from, uh, maybe an organization that that was on the wrong side of that scale before. So to to even just get it back to baseline, I think is pretty important. Otherwise, getting it to that quote best in class mentality, it's going to be a couple levels beyond that. But these aren't things that can change overnight, right, Alex? So mm-hmm. I think what you have to do is have expectations, but also understand the process to getting there. And that's where I think I spent some time thinking because when you're in the thick of it, when it's like you go out west and you come back oh five and oh. And you finish the year one fourteen and one outside of the Eastern time zone. Like I should say West, because obviously they got those wins in Sweden, but it, yeah. it was just so unbelievable that when you're in the thick of it night after night, day after day, it's, it's pretty tough. But then you think about it like, okay, there was a lot of change and how much time is reasonable to assume that you can change the direction of an organization. I'm hopeful. Ann Lauer saying all the right things. The new owner was on TSN 1200 for like a half hour. Fantastic (laughs) interview. like Uh, Really refreshing. And I think that that mentality is, is going to go far. Even just like last point I'll make on this and and the changes. We talk about the players. We talk about the management. That all makes sense. They're the front facing. They're the people that are going to change this around. But the investment that is being made in the workout facilities, the medical room, that's what's going to make Ottawa get off the joke always on a trade list thing. It's how you treat your players. And we've heard players come out and say, we're getting cold case at is under a heat lamp after the game. Like players talk and it's such a, a small league it that is. if you want to be the best and have great players that want to play for you, 
You need facilities to do that. And I, don't get me started on the rink. We'll be here all day. I was going to say, because that, no. but that, that is something that, you know, we'll see what, what happens, but it'll still be four or five years though. Yeah. Like I think that he understands that. And, and that's why they're making the decision to upgrade their current facilities as well, which like, I love the rink. I think it's very like, there's not a bad seat in the house. I think no. that it's a really nice rink from that standpoint, but it's, it was made in 95. Like, it's one of the most dated rinks. I, I heard the it's the second oldest rink in the league, and I almost fell off my chair. Well, it will be, I think. Because okay. Calgary's, I think, older, if not. I, like I think it's just those two are the oldest. Well, Madison Square Garden, but that's kind of oh. like in a world of itself, right? Yeah, because they, they did renovate it. It's, yeah. Yeah, that is a... I, have you ever been around Ann Lauer at all? Because No, I haven't. I, I've never he, met him. Because he is like the most, I mean, I have only been around one billionaire and that is Michael Anlauer, but, uh, <laughs> but he seems like the most like chill down to earth dude that you'll ever see. And he cares. And and I think what's great to see just with, you know, you talk about like the investment, like he's going to invest in the team. He's going to invest in the fans. Like it's, it's just going to be such a, you know, it might not translate on the ice, but I think at least for, for fans to feel like they're wanted, that they're cared for, um, you know, is kind of part of it. And then, you know, you get more butts in the seats, more people, you know, um, kind of following the team might maybe helps a couple wins here and there, but just overall, I think the team is going in the right direction, but I don't know what it will be like on the ice uh, this season. And, and I guess with that for you, Ross, um, is this a bit of a make or break year for this team? Because the core has been together for so long. Like, let's say they come out of the gates terribly as they've done every freaking year. Um, don't make the playoffs, aren't really in the hunt. Like, is this where like big moves have to kind of be made? Kind of a la the, the Leafs where they've been staying with the core, but um, probably should have moved on from it as well. Yeah, no, it's a fair question. I just don't want to get too far ahead of myself. I think training camp starts in, in eight days. I think they're on the That's ice right. on the 19th. Yeah. And I just, I think that there is something to be said for, for the group that is here. They're all good players. A lot of them are really high draft picks for a reason. And I think that, look, you've changed the coach now for the first time yep. under these guys. I Like, yeah, sure, Brady had a cup of coffee with Guy Boucher, an espresso shot with Mark Crawford. But really, DJ Smith's been the coach for this team from day one until midway through last year. So this is the first training camp they're going to have with a non-DJ Smith coach for Timmy, for Jake, for for those types of players. So I think that, yeah, this this is a huge, this is the biggest change that they've made, let alone the goalie, but they've been flopping goalies over and over and over yeah. and over. But I think the coach is going to make a huge difference. So basically I'm telling you, I want to see these players under this coach. But yeah, if, if they're disappointed again, and if there's no hope again, I mean, yeah, that's that's the next logical step is you're going to have to break up the core, which is pretty like you're talking about in Toronto, breaking up a core that's been top three in the division for six, seven straight years. It would be pretty asinine to have a team that can't get out of 21st or 28th or 29th. Um, so I'm I'm hopeful that that it won't. I do feel like the tie now playoffs, different question. There's a lot of teams that are going to be right there, but right. Ottawa needs to be sniffing around later yeah. in the season. I, did you see the Travis Green's, you know, hot starts in Vancouver? And you're like, this this is why we get, <laughs> he's the perfect coach just for the, the good starts. Like, is that almost the key to their season is to not fall behind the eight ball like they've done in, in years prior? Yeah, well, I'll tell you right now, Pilsy and I are going to be tracking the first 28 games of this season as seven game playoff series. We're playing four mm. seven game playoff series to start the year. So if you're a Sens fan, and you're like, wow, they haven't made the playoffs in seven years. Well, congratulations. October 10th is the first playoff game for the Ottawa Senators, and it's against the Stanley Cup champions. But oh. I, I mean it when I say that. Like, if they can't win four out of every seven games for the first 28 games of the season, I'm going to be very disappointed going into December. Hmm. That, that feels very fair. And and I guess, the, you know, the big offseason move was Allmark, and he's just been such – a joy for, for Sens fans. So, uh, you know, fun, a great personality, uh, introducing himself saying that he can't speak French, but he wants to, um, to some of the fans, but, um, how much do you like, you know, you talked about the goalie carousel that this team has had for, for years. Do you believe that like, he's the right man at the right time? And, and I think you, you tweeted a couple 
days ago that you're hoping for that big nice extension in like December like 20th or whatever is is that you know just maybe your thoughts on Allmark and, and what he provides to this team yeah I mean you just watch his highlight reel and it's pretty incredible he's a much bigger you can speak to it you've been he's around big. him in yeah. person he's, he's an like enormous human being yep. and I think he his reflexes everything but it's also his mindset right like 90 oh. percent of being a goalie is between the ears and how and do you how do you let a bad goal just kind of brush off your back? And I think he seems to have that personality he, and mindset. He, he literally said that last week. He said, you know, it's about the mentality and I, you know, I want to save every puck, but I know I'm not perfect. And it's all about, you know, just being okay. And, you know, it's taken a long time for me. Like he's literally saying every, all the right things that you don't really hear goalies verbalize all the time, but sorry, I cut you off. No, no, all good. I, I think it's very important context for it. And I think with with uh, Linus Allmark, like the skill speaks for itself. I'm not expecting him to have a 938 save percentage and win the Vesna this year. But I do think that he can be a guy that provides 917 to 919, like somewhere in that range where you're in the top 10 goalies in the National Hockey League. I don't think that that's too much to ask for him. And I know that the questions, they're going to come from the media and, and it makes sense. But I, I like the the thought process of both Steve Steos and Linus Allmark. Like let's just allow our city to sell itself to, to Linus and our organization going back to the new gym, the new medical facilities, all these things that when a player gets here, are they feeling taken care of? Is the family going to get jerseys and stuffies for the kids of Sparta cat? And uh, you know, like all these things that they don't count against the salary cap, how well you take care of your players but it certainly does make a difference of how uh, desirable a location is for your team. So I think Michael Anlauer understands that. I don't know if there's any organizations that treat their players better than in Montreal where Anlauer had been for the mm-hmm. last decade. So he gets it. And I think that that's going to be a big reason why, like if you ask me, is he going to stay or not? I think it's, I'd say 80%, maybe wow. even higher that, that Olmark signs an extension. It's also hard when you're 30 years old, to turn down forty million dollars, which is what I think he's probably going to get on his I, next deal. And if it's like six years, six years time. What's that like? Seven ish. Seven ish. I'm not a math guy. Forty. Okay. I, I think it's like six and a half. We'll we'll, we'll do it later. We'll do it later. Six point six seven would be forty. Uh, six by six point six seven would be forty million. You are a math guy and a goalie Close. guy. No, I'm kidding. No, that's crazy. I I'm a goalie guy. You're, you're a goalie guy, but um. With and you know what he he shouted out the IKEA being close to his to his new house so maybe that's the 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 thing that um gets the secures him to to stay in Ottawa um maybe transitioning a little bit to to the just the team on the ice and not just the goaltending position but how how do you feel about the forwards uh, depth on this team heading into this season because there has been a lot of change outside of the core they brought in Amadio Peron. Um, you know, hopefully Ridley Gregg has a you know another year under his belt. Shane Pinto can actually play 82 games. Like, just how do you feel about this team's forward group heading into the season? I have uh I need to see it, honestly. Like, I'm I'm feeling good about their top end talent. I've been banging the drum that uh, you know Drake Batherson can be a point per game player. That was one of my hot takes going into last year. I still believe that to be a possibility. I think that he has so much talent that it's just about the little things. And I think that David Perron in particular is going to be a huge help for getting him there because his biggest attribute is board battles and playing down low and extending offensive zone time. And those are areas where I think Drake has the talent, but sometimes he's too quick to want to make the quick play and, 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 you know, put a backhand saucer pass over there and, it's, it's actually uncanny how often he can get those through, but sometimes the easier play is just holding on to pucks and making the other team tired. And I think that over the course of a game, that can help. So I think Drake Batherson, for me, is a player to watch up front as almost like, look, the X factors are, are clear. Tim Stutzla needs more than one power play goal this year. I'd like him to get about 20 times that amount. Brady Kachuk, I just need him to stop fighting scrubs at the end of games. I know. I, I think it's just a tough look overall. And he's too like he, he's too tough and too talented. And he has too much of a, a stature yeah. to do that. Now, when he was the rookie, it was hilarious. But now it's like, okay, let, let I love when he drops the mats. Like the Truba fight, obviously. And if mm-hmm. he's standing up for teammates, I get it. But we don't need to be fighting T- Tyson Tucker or whatever in, in St. Louis. Okay. Yeah. 
Then you've got Josh Norris needs to stay healthy. Our Send Central Citizen today said 82 games for Josh Norris. That's a hot take. Piping hot, hot take. And Drake Batherson, like, I need him to be a plus player. I know plus minus isn't everything, but he's a guy who's been ice cold in that respect. He he took a big step forward after being a dash 30 two years ago. But yeah. I think if, if he can be a plus player, Brady too, never been a plus player of, above. I think he was plus one last year, if mm-hmm. I'm not mistaken. But I think for me, like these guys just need to maybe sacrifice a little bit offensively, some of them. To, to have that two-way game because I mean, there's no secret how the Senators have, have failed the last number of years. They can't keep the puck out of their net. Yeah, no. And, and you know, in their own zone, they've been just terrible. I did I did feel as though the team did make some some decent strides with Jacques Maltain, but it would kind of ebbed and flowed. Some games they'd play well, and then some – and then the goaltending was awful. I mean, you're down one nothing, two shots into the game 22 times. Like, oh, my God. That is the craziest stat. That and is. it's just like, it's not even just a goalie stat, but how deflating if you're on the bench. Well, you're, you're almost out of the game. Like it's yeah, just, well, you'd, you'd rather just start the game down one, nothing rather than have to go through the motions and be like, all right, how's he going to let this one in and float over his shoulder backdoor tap in. What's it going to be? How much do you think of last year's problem? Like on the goaltending was solely on the goaltending. Do you a think lot. that's like the majority of the, issues from last season yeah like i go back to that rangers game uh i'm sure people remember that Kreider goal where he just he looked like he was doing just a flow drill in practice and and he's like a shot from the top of the hash marks and look if corpus allo goes to boston and his helmet fits him properly i'm gonna snap like i didn't understand that his helmet was fitting down onto his eyes like i don't know how he could see the puck and like we it became like a running gag on locked on sends but like it's not that funny like, no. we'll just wear a helmet that fits. You'll see the puck. You'll stop the puck. So, I don't know. They always talk about this goalie Bob guy in Boston being, like, some sort of whisperer, and he's one of the best coaches. Well, he's got his work cut out for him because he just – he was all over the place. He was – if you're a goalie, your number one job is to stop the puck. Duh. Number two is to give your team confidence when you're out there. Oh. And even the saves he was making were so athletic. Yeah. And, and not – compact not like think of freddie anderson and me as one of those the best goalies where he's not even the most athletic but he just everything hits him like velcro and corpus Allo's rebound control is just so bad i get yeah. angry talking about it because last year was i can't believe they gave him a five-year contract but i can't believe steve steos got out of it too yeah with only holding one million that is actually incredible that is honestly the first round pick for all mark oh yeah no doubt Almost. like it that was that that was a pretty incredible trade, even if Allmark isn't here for for a long time. But I, I guess with that, like you know, with the the four group, like how much do you like the kind of addition? Like, do you think if the Sens are to be successful this year, it's just that Tim Stutzla is like a hundred point guy, or do you think the depth is maybe also you know finally put into place? Unlike past couple of years, where they really weren't getting much from their third and fourth line. I think a lot more of the depth for me up front is going to be about leadership in the locker room and what they're adding in terms of just guys who have been there and done that. I think when it comes to winning games and putting up scores that you're going to need your top guys to be just that. Mm -hmm. Like I'm not expecting David Perron to be a 50, 60 point guy. I think he's going to be a a 20 and 20, like a a 40 point guy. So Mm -hmm. I think it's, it is going to be on the top paying players, the guys who have been here, the guys who are the top power play unit, they need to be able to produce. So yeah, to me, that's the biggest thing. I think everything else, like whether they got David Perron or insert free agent B here, right? I don't think that it's moving the needle that much more. They had to add players. I know they traded Matthew Joseph, and I do like the upgrade that Michael Amadio brings in that role. Joseph was, when he was on his game, was awesome. But one thing I actually, I think I said this the other day on Locked on Sends, but uh, it's worth repeating. All the players they got rid of from last year, they brought inconsistent efforts. When they were good, yeah. they were really good. Chikrin and um, Joseph, and and Joseph most notably. But these guys might not have the highs that those players have, but they're certainly not going to have the lows either. And I think that that consistency the- of a more less high event time when those guys are out on the ice will allow 
the top players to have more opportunity. Well, that's that's actually exactly what Steve Steo said. You know, at yeah. the little presser a couple last week was that it's about a day, like it's the work every day, getting better every day. It's about consistency. And that's kind of a la what you were talking about is that it's not about, you know, just being great. It's about the work you do every day. And and that's the problem with this team is, you know, we Jack Maltang would talk about it all the time last year. It's like we get too high and then we get too low and we need yep. to be in that middle and, and consistent. And I think that's what this team's lacked is maybe it's a bit of immaturity because the team was so young, you know, I'm not blaming 22 year olds for getting emotional. That's kind of how it works, but just being kind of level and steady, right. With that team is just really not had the past couple of years when they've been a pretty talented team that, you know, underachieved. Could not agree more. It's just like you, that that's, I think what's most frustrating, Alex, you can see the talent. Oh. It just hasn't been able to come together. I, it, exactly. I, I I guess with the talent, like the the going to the decor, because that's where I really get a bit worried with this team is the depth. I like the Kalen Addison, just like give it a run, see what he's like in, in camp. But um, how do you feel about this decor heading into the season that maybe on paper was better last year? Maybe not as uh, probably didn't fit as well as it does this year. But how do you feel about this decor with trading out Chikrin for Jensen, not really having a, a bottom pair left-hand defenseman. You can go Tyler Clevin, but he's only played a couple of games in the NHL. Just where you're at with that. Yeah, I think they're different, but are they better? That's a question that's going to take time to answer. I think Nick Jensen is is one of those stabilizers as well. So he's he's those guys where it's like less is more, and you might not hear their name as much on the broadcast as you do with a Jacob Chikrin. But that's not necessarily a bad thing when the left side of the D is where you have your horses, your Sanderson and Shabbat. Like Shabbat needs to stay healthy, and it sounds like he's finally gotten whatever's been bothering his wrist taken care of. That's critically important because I actually thought when he was healthy last he year, was good. I thought he had a I thought he had a really good year. Now, how much of that is less being asked of him? Like this guy, I I, I tweeted it out recently. What the heck was it? I think from the time he entered the league. He hold, I know he holds the second and third most time in a single game, but he's his name is littered all over that. That it's not a good stat. Be like, that's, oh, he plays the most. That was, like that's not good. That's that bad. Good, and yeah. Yeah. I'm surprised that. And maybe it has. Maybe that's what's caused this long term damage. So hopefully he has been able to get healthy because man, he's so talented. You think back to him in junior, and be, he's still the only defenseman to ever win World Juniors MVP. Only defenseman so good. ever. Ugh. And he's got so much upside, and he's still only, what, 27? That should be the prime of his career, and we talk about him like he's Travis Hamannick. So there's another guy where it's like, he's your horse. You've paid this horse. Now let him run, and hopefully mm-hmm. he can do that. Because remember when Guy Boucher was coaching, all the left side of the decor, it was Mathot, it was Borbietsky, and it was Dion Phaneuf, not in that order. Those guys knew their role was to left wing lock, stand up at the blue line, create loose pucks so that the Chris Weidman, Cody CC, and Eric Carlson's of the world can move the puck on the right side. Now, at least, you have the right side of Jensen, Zub, and likely JBD, who are going to be that role that the left side used to be. Yep. So at least everybody knows their roles. And as a forward, you're going to be able to be more on top of, okay, they're rushing down the left side. Like if this puck gets loose, they're probably going to swing it to the, to the right. So mm-hmm. I think that that even just that little bit of um, whether it's muscle memory or what, I think it could help. Now, maybe this is me just grasping at straws, but it just did not fit the way it was last year. And it was just awkward. And how many times were Shabbat and Chikrin both on the left side in their own zone? And Bro. then you'd look and be like, why is somebody wide open over there? It just did not fit. So I'm happy. That a lot of people are like, oh, they got fleeced on that trade. Yeah, you would have liked to have had a better than a third-round pick coming back, especially after they had to give up a third-round pick to get rid of Joseph. But, like, Jensen for Chikrin, it doesn't look fair on paper, but I think with Ottawa already having Sanderson and Shabbat, it makes a whole lot more sense to have Nick Jensen. My my only worry is just on the left side, I like it's not that I don't believe in Clevin as an NHLer. I just don't know if he's ready to be that full time bottom. I'm pair. the opposite. I, I'm so I'm more concerned about JBD 
than I am okay. about Tyler Clavin. Maybe maybe JBD was just like the best player to me in the locker room, so I have a bit of a soft spot for him. So maybe my bias is coming in, but I I, I do agree. Like I thought he was that pairing with Chikrin just did not work last year. Um, but that is true. They do have Hammond, but I don't think he's going to play that much. They did bring in Addison, which I, is an interesting wrinkle because I could see him maybe being in that third pairing. He's not really a defensive defenseman. No, he's he's not. He's going to be your offenseman. Like he's he's yeah. no defense. But at the same time, like I, I like that they're bringing in PTOs. If for nothing else, just letting JBD know, like this isn't your job. Like you're not walking in here and just taking this job. No, I, I definitely agree with that. I, I, I guess what what makes you so high on, or maybe not so high, but just be, a believer in Clevin outside that, you know, he's mean and uh, Pierre Dorian's, what was it? What did he say about Clevin that? Oh, uh, if he could just have one, if he could adopt a son or something like that, yeah, it'd be Tyler like Clevin. Hilarious. Well, Clevin won. He comes from a fantastic family. I've had a chance to get to know them through our time at when I go down to North Dakota and obviously his family's mm-hmm. from Fargo, which is nearby to Grand Forks. And then we got to spend a little time both in Winnipeg and in Minnesota when, when Tyler was on the trip last year with cool. the Sens and they're just, they're good people. I think he was raised to to be a tough, you know, n- not take anything for granted. And, and I think he's just one of those low maintenance players that yeah. he, Sure, he, he hasn't really arrived yet, eight games, then nine games. But what I do really expect to see more of from Clevin this year is using his body at the NHL level. We yeah. found out that he did this a lot more and more in the AHL as the season went along, but we haven't had one of those patented huge K-train hits over the trolley tracks where you, you're looking and thinking it's an old-school Anton Volchenkov hit. Like We haven't had that yet, but the moment I see that for the first time, I'm going to be convinced that that guy should never go back to Belleville. And he has pretty good hands, honestly, for a guy he that's kind of labeled as that kind of just big, thick guy who oh, hasn't really ripped the puck, too. Yep, exactly. So I my just worry is that if one of those top two defensemen go down, like who's what's left? And, and that's, that's fair. Yeah, I don't think Clevin's a guy you want yet playing in a top four at the NHL level. That's fair. But also, like, he's not that young anymore, right? Because he went to school for three years and he then went, played 23? that year. Like, He'll be, he'll be 24 in January. Yeah. Wow. Like during this or sorry, sorry. He'll be 23 in January, but even still like you're, you're a second round pick. Like I think he should be expecting to make the jump at this point. He's going to have to earn it. He doesn't need um, waivers. So th- they could send him down. No problem. But I think that he's going to earn a spot. I'm just convinced. I think he's got the right mindset for it. And I think we're going to see him take that spot in preseason. I mean, maybe the question is just, about this decor isn't really about who's the the five six or the you know the you know how does Nick Jensen do it's about is Jake Sanderson a, a Norris trophy maybe not contender but kind of elevates himself to one of the best defensemen in, in the league and I thought you know he kind of struggled with as the team struggled midway through that season last year but then at the end of the season he really I thought took off was scoring more offensively you could really see him dazzle with his speed and you know you know his offensive game kind of coming around a little bit like is he just he's he's my favorite send to watch in a lot of ways just because he's so fast so smart so big uh just just a pleasure to watch couldn't agree more man it's like, there's so many of those guys though right like it just it feels like they they are Maybe I'm just a homer. I don't know. I don't know. It feels I like they shoot. They I like a lot of their pieces, and that's why it just it puts me in a pretzel trying to figure out why they haven't been able to have success. I just don't understand it. Really? Do you, do you, do you think it's just maybe a losing culture? Because maybe. that that's what I think. Not well, they that... burned it down and built it back up, right? Like how many guys are are there from two years ago? From like from like an off ice standpoint. Oh, oh, like nobody, almost that's, nobody. That's yeah. a thing. Yeah, it's completely different. At least even even uh, when I saw people at um, on Wednesday and you see kind of a couple coaches and everything, like it was very different. Like there are a couple similar faces, but even last year, what was interesting being around the team is that almost it was like every two, like month or two, you just see, oh, there's a new face. There's a new face. There's a new face. Yeah. Right? It kind of grew and grew as the season went on. And I think this year, like, I, I mean, I haven't been around the team at training camp or anything, but I think that's what you'll see too. Is like, whoa, it's like very, very 
everything's different. Um, and I think in a good way, shout out to our boy, uh, Ian Mendez as, as well for, for taking the, the gig with the sends too. So that'll be a, a fun site. But um, I do think that this team, as you said, it's about kind of changing that culture and culture is used way too much in sports. But if you lose consistently for years and years and years, it's hard to kind of get and out of it. Years and years and years. Yeah. Yeah. And it's you look a long at time, dude. And it's interesting because all Mark said, you know, he talked about his experience in Boston and in Buffalo and Buffalo was like the worst team in the league when he was there. Like, yeah, well, that was the Taylor Hall year, I think was his last I, year, which is I like a crazy. Right. And he talked about how he, he did feel it was a cultural thing. Like you just get used to losing. And in Boston, it was the opposite. You just get used to winning and that's the expectation. And it's interesting just hearing that it's like, okay, like, you know, it is a thing. Um, I don't know. He said that he thinks goalies can be leaders. I, I think so to some extent, but it's kind of hard to, to to change how your team plays in front of you as a goalie. I don't know how you translate that, but overall, um, I think it is a bit of a culture. And I do think Travis Green seems like a smart guy. Um, I don't want to hear one more thing that they're going to be in the best shape of their life. Because oh, you will. That's this time I, of year, oh, baby. Will. You got to love it. I will, but it's like... What else? It's like, nah, you can you can come in a couple pounds heavy. Don't worry. You'll burn it yeah. off. No, no coach would ever say that. Right. So um, yeah. Is is there I guess what what do you think what needs to go right for this team if they're gonna take that step and maybe, maybe you'll finally get that first playoff game, locked on sends playoff game against the Leafs. No, I'm kidding. Oh but, my god. Oh, oh. my god. What would be a successful season? Can I just say November? Like honestly, if they get past November and it's it's looking so good, what at 28 games, what what does that record need to look like for you to be satisfied? Right. Well, based on what I'm saying, they need to win four out of every seven, but I'd like it to be even more than that in a perfect world. Like um 16, 10, and they, two. They need to be they need to be within two points of the final playoff spot, if not in it. I think I'm even setting the bar pretty low there that they can even be outside the playoffs at that point. Cause if you look at their schedule, like I am right now, early on in the season, like there's, there's a lot of winnable games and there's a lot of games that you, you're going to have to circle and say, Hey, let's, let's exercise some demons like yeah. that West coast trip. The first one of the year, like I already mentioned the record one fourteen and one last year, West of the Eastern time zone. Well, guess what? The sixth, seven and eighth game of the season, you're at Utah you're at Vegas and you're at Colorado. Like those two last teams in particular are going to be tough tests and you have to win at least one of those games. Like you, I, I can't have it where it's just like, Oh, they're a good team. We're going to lose. Like whenever they play Carolina, Ottawa just guarantee. Oh, oh. Like they just need to exercise some of those demons, but yeah. I don't want it to come at the cost because if you look at the last couple of years, Ottawa's actually been really good against the Atlantic division. They have like been. against Toronto, Montreal, Detroit, Buffalo, Buffalo, even Boston, Ottawa was the only team to beat Boston twice two years ago yeah. when they were having their historic season. So like, it's interesting because they just can't play the Western Conference. It's very interesting. Uh, the 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 th I don't want to talk about it because I feel like I'm jinxing it, but the fact that the World Juniors are in Ottawa and they have just like that two week long uh, road trip just like every year like with Sweden last year just one one year can they just get like a normal schedule I just I just hope hope to god that happens one time but I I I totally agree I think you know going with that my kind of worry a little bit it just you alluded to the how well they've done against the Atlantic division which I hope they do again because that will be very very imperative with essentially none of the teams I think will be too, too bad this year. I think, you know, Detroit wants to obviously jump yep. into the playoffs. Buffalo, just uh, Buffalo. But they're a pretty talented team, very young, kind of similar to the Senators. And then obviously Montreal's taking some big steps. I still think talent-wise they're probably the the bottom feeder, but they're definitely much more improved than, than last season. How much of maybe the hurdle for this team this year will just be the fact that their division is a gauntlet? It's the toughest division in hockey. Like, is, or do you agree with that? Yeah, I would. I was talking to Luke Fox. He said, "I think it like he was worried about the Leafs just because the that's the the toughest division for sure." I don't think it's, that any. 
Yeah, you can't even really argue it, can you? Like the Metropolitan, they've got probably more middling teams. Yep. Like you look the Islanders, what's Washington going to be with all those changes? Philadelphia probably wants to take a step forward, but in terms of like top like top 5 goalies in the National Hockey League, what th- at least two are in Is the Atlantic the and no, okay. No, well, <laughs> no, because I'm looking. Saros and Hellebuck aren't, and no. that would obviously swing things towards but the Vassal Central Division. You but could yeah. say Swayman and Allmark are top eight or something in the league. Well, and Vasilevsky right there, yeah. and then uh, we're also missing out Bobrovsky. on Bobrovsky, who just was unbelievable. Like those four goalies in the division are like that's a gauntlet just in of itself. Yeah, no, it's it's gonna be a bloodbath. I wonder what that changes for just like the the points that the teams need to, to get into the playoffs, both divisions, you know, in, in the Eastern conference itself, but just because all the teams are really competitive, like outside of maybe Columbus and, uh, you know, even before the tragic passing of Johnny Goudreau, like they were probably the only team that was going to be pretty bad and everyone else was going to be like at least competitive. And I, I wonder if we, we look back, you know, into the season and it's like the team making the last playoff spot has like 90 points because everyone's just in that mushy middle. What what do you think about that? That's interesting because, I mean, they're all going to kind of play each other and, and ba- excuse me, battle it out. But I just don't want any excuses. I think just play the games on your schedule, win more of them, and you'll be fine. <laughs> like, I know that's a, a yeah. very basic way of looking at it, Alex, but we just, for year after year, we're always thinking – thinking like two years ago, I said Boston was going to be a team that missed the playoffs. They have a historic season. So who am I to predict? Goalie though. Right now they don't have a goal. Yeah. Corpy Corpy is their starter. Corpy is their starter. We need, we need to see that Corpus Allo start against the Sens. And I, I just can see him just being unbelievable and getting like a 45 save shutout. I it would know. be so Sens. It would be so sense. Um, before I let you go, is there anything you kind of want to, and thanks so much for, for taking the time and doing this. Is there anything you want to plug for you? No, show? not at all, man. I just want to plug the behind the play podcast. Well, thank this you. Is awesome. Alex really appreciate what you're doing and love that you're in the mix at practice and all that now covering the team. So um, no, keep up the great work. We're always happy to join you. Hopefully Pillsy does great with oh. you just a little bit less than me, but uh, less. jokes aside, no, we, <laughs> we love to see what you're doing and uh, continued success. And I'm sure we'll be chatting again soon down the road. Well, thank you so much. And you guys have been such a huge help in my career and for this podcast and everything. So I I'm, I'm forever indebted to you guys. Um, it just, I'm no, very, you're good, I'm man. very, uh, you know, thankful to you guys, but I'm also, you guys are, succeeding for a reason and it's awesome to see and i feel like every every month it's like oh you're at like nine thousand subscribers or like eight thousand subscribers so it's it, you guys are you're, you're getting up there and it's great to see so thank you so much for, for taking the time talking some sense and hopefully hopefully we can talk about a playoff team that's Ooh. it's been too long it's been too that, long were that's you, the goal were you still at lisger when uh, the Suns made the playoffs i'm kidding oh no, come on uh, basically <laughs> i was actually at lisger when they made the stanley cup final so maybe i gotta go oh, back do a little billy madison oh my god now i feel young <laughs> <laughs> oh awesome well thanks so much ross everyone uh, check out the lockdown senators podcast the best sense podcast out there and, and we'll do this again thank you very much